Hi everybody. I'm going to start off this week by working through the transcription examples from this past week. So we'll do the, the second species counterpoint first. Since we know this is second species, um, you know, your, your test will be from species counterpoint. I won't necessarily tell you right now which species it will be, but the next upcoming test will have a two-voice transcription from species counterpoint. So whichever species it happens to be, you know that certain rules apply. In this case, we know that there are going to be half notes in the upper voice until the end, at which point um, we may be full of half notes here. We may move on to, uh, we may have whole note, whole note here in the approach to the end. Uh, we also know that the cantus firmus will proceed in whole notes. We know almost certainly, you know, that the cantus firmus will end on C, probably D going down to C because this is in C major or, uh, or C mode. So I'm going to go ahead and play it and I'll transcribe what I hear. I, you know, I did this a few days ago, so I don't actually remember the, the melody precisely off the top of my head, so I'm actually working through it at this moment. I'm going to go for Cantus Firmus first. So, we had a little skip there, a lot of uh, Cantus Fermi move in stepwise motion, as this one mostly does, uh, but a couple of the tricky moments here are this little skip from G down to E, you know, it's tempting to sort of assume that it would have gone, you know, so la, so fa, mi, re, do, whereas instead it's going to go so mi, re, do. That's a little a little trick. Uh, hopefully you were able to figure out that there were not enough notes for it to actually have a fa in it, or you were able to work backwards from the uh, cadence right there. Another one here is this little change of direction. Do, re, fa, mi, fa, sol, la. Um, Cantus firmus moves slowly enough that in general you can follow its notes pretty easily. You shouldn't have to take too much time. Uh, to transcribe the, the cantus firmus. But in this case, it's helpful to think about tendency tones. You know, when we're in the, the um, major mode, when we're in C major here, four has the tendency to pull down to three, um, seven has the tendency to go up to one. We don't hear that in this example. Uh, you'll rarely hear the seventh scale degree in a cantus firmus. But four you get a lot of. So here we have do, re, fa, mi. So I know that's a leap. Um, I know that I can hear it kind of wanting to pull down so it's not do, re, so or something like that. Um, but those are maybe the two little tricks to this one. Hopefully they're not too difficult, but those are the two moments where you might go astray. Let's listen for the counterpoint now. So, so it's starting on the fifth. Alright, so um, I think I've got that. You'll notice here, for example, what I'm doing, I'm not really taking the time to make half notes. I'm putting 
dots or messy little uh, marks here to kind of track the melody. Um, this, you know, I went pretty fast on this. Uh, the memory was sort of coming back to me, and I've, I've done this a lot, so I can transcribe things pretty quickly, particularly when they're controlled like counterpoint is. Um, but for example, you might uh, mark things like leaps. You might mark changes of direction. This one is a slightly tricky little figure. Um, this is actually supposed to be a D, I believe. Mi, re, or no. Mi, mi, re, do, ti, re, do, fa, mi. So there are a couple of little changes of direction here. You might mark um, this one, for example, the E, D, C, B, and back up. This one's a little bit odd. Um, a lot of times when, I, when I'm dealing with leaps, I'll draw. This is supposed to be sort of a slur marking to show a leap if I need to leave a space in my transcription and here for kind of like change of direction. Um, you don't really have time to draw an arrow up or an arrow down, but that's what that's meant to be an abstract version of. Um, here would be another sort of change of direction, a leap, change of direction, uh, which other one here. Here's a big leap. This one uh, makes you think a little bit. Once you've done this, once you've marked some leaps and things like that, you're probably ready to hear it again. We won't do that right at this moment. Um, because I want to talk about the ways that you can use counterpoint, you know, and your knowledge of music theory in general to kind of do a little bit of, uh, of helping yourself here. Uh, when I'm labeling counterpoint intervals, I'm not usually worried about major, minor, um, or perfect. I'm just going to use the numerical values. Uh, since I'm giving you these counterpoints to transcribe, you can be confident that they're, they're not going to do illegal things. Um, so you don't need to worry quite so much about, oh, is that perfect or diminished interval or something like that. Um, you know, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Um, nor, nor is this theory one where you're still kind of trying to make sure that students understand the difference between a major third and a minor third or a major sixth and a minor sixth. Once we're in, you know, theory two territory, you're not really concerned with that. So, first of all, I can kind of track what's going on in the downbeats. Um, that is third or tenth, you know. I'll write tenth, in fact. That's a bit more correct when it's an interval like that. We usually worry about that if it's a compound interval less than a fifth, you know, a twelfth. Um, we'll usually write a ninth or a tenth or an eleventh. Ten. So I can fill those intervals in then. This is uh, an eleventh or a fourth, another eleventh or a fourth. So you'll recall uh, in second species, dissonances can happen on the weak beats. Those need to resolve on the strong beat of the next one. Your strong beats need to have consonants. Here we've got sixth. Uh, if we're dealing with a leap, one of the reasons why marking a, where a leap happens can be useful is that you know a leap in uh, any species of counterpoint needs to involve consonances. Um, so in fourth species, you cannot leap to a suspension um, because you have to have prepared that suspension beforehand. In second species, you can't have your weak beat uh, be a dissonant leap. So since we're leaping here, I know this has to be a leap to basically a third, a fifth, an octave. You wouldn't leap you know, from a sixth to another sixth unless you're doing an octave. Um, but I know it has to be consonant in this case. It's six, eight. When voices move, uh, blanking on the word, when voices move against each other, a contrary motion, when voices move in contrary motion away from an octave, you know that it becomes a sixth. Fifth happens to be a consonant. I always like to mark that six five or five six motion there. Um, G up to B. Tenth, again, a dissonance here. 
collapses to another tenth point. Nope, that's not a, that's, I'm misreading my own notation, sorry. That's not a fourth there, that is actually supposed to be a D. So that's a fifth collapsing to a fourth. Here, A up to F is a sixth. Down another sixth. This is dissonant, must be a passing tone. Um, and indeed, it's going to go up to a tenth. Another tenth down here. You know, we don't double this one, we just call them both tenths. Five, right? D up to A. Six, eight. So we can see here in this quick transcription um, that this counterpoint follows all of the rules of second species counterpoint. If we were to find something, you know, for example, here that's a little bit off, um, if you find, for example, a dissonance that's on a downbeat, you know that there's something wrong with your transcription. You know that you've made a mistake if you put a fourth or a seventh on a downbeat for example, or if you leap to what looks like a dissonant interval, um, you know there's something wrong. A couple of other things you might keep in mind, just as we heard, you know, do, re, fa, mi, here the fa, mi tendency tone. Um, this is another moment, for example, where that happens. Re, do, fa, mi, this big leap up to the top. Um, is, you know, the very strong four down to three. If you start to lose yourself in the stream of notes, um, you can always listen out for four to three or seven to one to kind of help to orient yourself a little bit. Um, and let's see, what was the last thing that I wanted to mention? Oh yeah, the apex. So uh, another concept from Species Counterpoint is that a good counterpoint um, in first or second species, we're less concerned about this with fourth species, but it can still happen. Uh, good species counterpoint will have a single apex, um, which means that you'll have only one of the very highest note of the counterpoint. In, in this sense, it is uh, this G up here. So another thing, another way that you can use your counterpoint knowledge is uh, if you've got you know, multiple high G's or something like that, you know that there might be some kind of an error. If you've got multiple high F's, you know, you could have ended up with another F here. Uh, you would know that there's something wrong because the apex is not going to be repeated in one of these examples that I give you for transcription. Um, so I think that more or less goes through it. Let's kind of go through and check our work. We'll listen to it one more time. Then we will do uh, the rhythm. Do Good. So that's all good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sort of turn my hash marks here into really ugly half notes. I don't mind if your, you know, if your transcriptions are this messy, um, as long as they're legible, as long as you can tell what note is which. That's just fine. So one last tip that really occurs to me in this, uh, for this example, other counterpoint examples, and even non-contrapuntal uh, transcriptions, is to listen in terms of gestures. So, for example, listen for the way that something arrives at the tonic, listen for little recognizable three-note or four or five-note bits 
So for example, this do, so, fa, so, la, ti, do. This is sort of one complete idea, you know, no coincidence that it's then broken up by that octave leap. Um, you've got a different thing here, and then you have me. Mm, let's jump down the octave. Mi, re, that was very messy, that's actually re. Mi, re, do, ti, re, do. Another kind of distinct idea. Mi, re, do, ti, re, do, all hovering around do like that. Uh, and then another leap kind of breaks it up. Fa, mi, fa, so. You might hear that little bit independently, and then so, la, ti, do. Um, so there are all kinds of different ways to hear this. You can really kind of track the stepwise motion. Um, you can hear in little gestures. You know, you'll listen differently depending on which species of counterpoint it is. Um, and you can listen for kind of points of disjunction. You know, I was marking things with slurs where it was a leap, and I might need to go fill in exactly what kind of leap. Um, you can also think of these as being divisions between the important parts of your counterpoint. So hopefully that's uh, useful for how to work through an example like this, how I would approach an example like this. Uh, you may have another one this week that you can apply this to. I'll do the rhythm in a separate file.